Hello and welcome to BST Live. Glad you could join us today where we're going to be talking about identifying trends and uh, glad you could join us today for this. Perhaps it's Valentine's Day for you, perhaps not, but let's get started. Okay, well, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. As I just mentioned, perhaps it's Valentine's Day for you if you're in the States or if you're in Australia or somewhere else, then you've uh, just uh, passed Valentine's Day. Hope you're all having a great Valentine's Day. And it's quite applicable that we're here today to talk about our love or our second love, perhaps, and that is trading. And joining us today, we have a trend specialist. He is a senior, he's been, sorry, he's been a senior market analyst and investing coach with over 30 years of experience in the financial markets, and he's director of research at Trendline Dynamics. Say hello to Doc Ahrens. Welcome, Doc. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing well. How are you doing over there? Is it cold where you are? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I'm excited to be talking with you today because um, I know you've prepared quite a few slides and you've got a lot of examples for us. So we've got some great stuff to talk about today. But how about before we actually get into talking about trends, why don't you, uh, can you give us some of your background on yourself and uh, so we can get a little bit of context about where you're coming from and what we'll be talking about today? Sure. Um, I made my first. Uh investment in the stock market in late September of 1987. Uh, bought about $600 worth of some mutual fund that a friend had recommended and uh, thought that was a pretty good idea. And uh, about three weeks later, discovered it was suddenly worth $200 and uh, was thinking, that wasn't what I had in mind. <laughs> Um, so that, that sort of soured me on, on the stock market for a while, but, uh, about 1990, I got interested again, um, started reading everything I could get my hands on magazines, books, and so forth, uh, joined the Dallas traders group, uh, got to meet some, some really smart people, uh, Greg Morris, uh, Glenn Ring, and, uh, so um, I started writing my own software. Um, even though there was software available, I figured if I really wanted to understand what was going on, I had to write my own um, and been doing that ever since. So um, that's, that's what got us here today. <laughs> yeah, excellent. So uh, I know we're going to talk a, quite a lot about some of your research a little bit later, but um, first of all, I want to start, I've been following your work for quite a while now and I find it really interesting. And one thing that I've noticed um, is part of your work is this uh, macro trend analyzer, MTA, I think you call it for short. And I think um, it seems to be like an integral part of what you do. And yeah, I think, I think uh, people might be interested to hear more about it. So can you give us a little bit of an introduction in, um, uh, what is what is it? What's the MTA? The Macro Trend Analyzer um, is its whole purpose is to follow the macro trend, um, and it was based on uh, something that I read. Um, Bill Williams had an indicator called the Alligator um, that I read mm. about in uh, Technical Analysis Magazine. And uh, he set his indicator up to run very fast. Um, he, was, he was running three, three moving averages, and uh, they, were, they were short. Uh, there was a five-day, and eight-day, and 13-day. And um, so I started tinkering around with that. And uh, what I did was I took his original periods uh, and expanded those to 13, 21, and 34, uh, and used weekly data instead of um, instead of daily data, and that's created the MTA, which um, is 
now part of my standard chart set for for everything that I analyze uh, because mm. it uh, is reasonably responsible. Excuse me, responsive, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, it, uh, it it does a good job uh, calling the turns and uh, so. That's where that came from. Yeah, okay. So I've got a, a few questions about um, the modifications you made. But first of all, uh, I know you've got a, um, a slide for us to have a look at to kind of demonstrate how it looks, right? So let me just put that on the screen. Uh, something like this. So. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the, the MTA averages. I brought that up in stockcharts.com. Mm. Um, Partly to show people that if there's if there isn't an MTA chart available on my site for something that they want to analyze, they can actually do it themselves on stockcharts.com because on stock charts you can change the period from daily to weekly, even if you're not a member. Um, and after you set the period to weekly, uh, you just set up three averages: uh, 13, 21, and 34. And uh, there you are. Hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, so we're going to dig into this a little bit more in a minute, but I can uh, imagine some people are saying, okay, well, triple moving average, you know, three moving averages, we've seen that before. But I think a common application of using that is on the daily chart, and you've actually applied it here to weekly. So why the change from daily to weekly? What does that give you? Um. The reason I switched over to weekly is because it's somewhat quieter, uh, but it doesn't introduce a lot of lag. Uh, if we go to the, uh, the slide with the, uh, the black backgrounds on the, on the uh, line charts. This one? Yeah, that one. Yeah. Um, okay. Now, one of those is, uh, is daily data and one of them is monthly and one of them is weekly um but as you're looking at that on a line chart it's virtually impossible to tell which one's which mm -hmm. um, market price movements are fractal which means no matter what time scale you're on they pretty much behave in similar ways um so if we go to the, the next chart with with the candlesticks. Yeah. Now, those are the same three charts, but displayed with candlesticks instead of uh, line charts. And uh, we have a little quiz for the viewers, uh, <laughs> which one is which? Okay. All right. Well, let's see in the chat, A, B, or C. Which one is, uh, what were the options again? Sorry, weekly, daily, uh, sorry, daily, weekly, and monthly? Yeah, there's there's a daily, weekly, and monthly. Okay. Yep. And so the, uh, the interesting thing is it is possible to tell once you get into candlesticks, but how do you do it? Uh, okay. So this isn't a trick question. There is an actual legitimate answer. But, um, so what do you think? Uh, mm -hmm. Put it in the chat. A, B, or C, daily, weekly, or monthly. Let's see. Um, here we go. Uh, Al says daily is C. Uh, sorry, daily is C, weekly is B, daily is A. Al, I think you meant one of those was monthly. Which one do you think is monthly? David Webster, C is daily. Let's have a look. Mm, perhaps. Neil, C is daily. B is weekly, A is monthly. Chuck says B is weekly. FM says C is daily. Okay, we've got quite a lot of <laughs> a lot of guesses here now. It's um, how about we? Uh, what's the answer, Doc? What is it? Got the quite. Real, a... The real question is how do you tell the difference? Yeah, how do you tell? If you start looking at the gaps. If you count the gaps, the one with the most gaps is daily. Ah. The one with the fewest is the monthly. And right. 
the, the objective of this, this exercise is that if you're trying to decide what time scale to use, um, what you want to do is figure out how much delay you can, can deal with. Okay, if you're if you're dealing with a 10-year chart, then it doesn't make a whole lot of difference whether you use monthly or weekly data. Um, but if you're dealing with a one-year chart, then yeah, there's there's a big difference because on the weekly chart, you have an average phase lag of two and a half days. Uh, on the monthly, you've got a phase lag of just over 10 days. So there's a lot more lag there. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to quiet the noise um, and not incur too much lag. So that's why I went to the weekly one because it gives us reasonably good um, quieting mm -hmm. and uh, it only introduces a little bit of lag. So, so that's why I switched from daily, which is which lots of gaps, lots of noise, um, went over to weekly and uh, that way cut down on some of that without introducing too much lag. Mm. Okay. So I think as well, you also mentioned that you changed the periods. Um, uh, I think you said they were originally three, five and eight or three, eight and 15 or something like that. Why did you change those? Well, uh, the periods that, that Bill Williams used um, were were really great if if you were doing daily trading. Um, and most of the people that uh, are using my website are people who are managing their retirement money. And they don't want to be switching in and out of stuff every five minutes, so to speak. Um, so we wanted a longer time period. And uh, by going to uh, the weekly chart and, and the longer time periods, um, was able to slow the, the average time in each position down to uh, about 200 days. Mm, so okay. that, was, that was why we went with the longer periods. Mm, okay. That's an interesting idea because I think a lot of people just pick the the moving average or the indicator length first and see what comes out. But you, you've actually thought about how, how often do I want to trade, what kind of frequency, what kind of length, and adjusted it backwards based on that. I think that's, that's an interesting approach. Was that accidental or was that uh, done that way on purpose? Well, that was that was quite intentional. Mm. Um, back in back in the early two thousands, when when we had the dot com crash, um, there was a lot of people in the company I worked for who lost a lot of money uh, in their retirement accounts, and uh, so a lot of my friends knew that I was doing market stuff and after we finally hit the bottom in 2003, um, they were, they were asking me, he says, okay, now what do we do? Uh, and so I started working seriously on uh, a long-term trend following system that was specifically designed uh, for handling things like retirement accounts where, you know, you can't watch it every day. Um, and you don't want to be switching back and forth because um, that can, in some retirement uh, programs, that can be problematic. Uh, so we wanted something that was um, longer duration, um, but still uh, it took care of your money. It got you in when the market was going up and it got you out uh, before it did too much damage on the way down. Hmm. Yep. Okay, so I want to ask you about how you um, apply those three moving averages in a minute. But before we do that, I think I noticed that the moving average periods you you talked about then were Fib numbers. Is that is that correct? And if so, then why why do you use Fibonacci numbers? Um, yeah, Bill Williams used the the three Fibonacci numbers uh, 
5, 8, and 13. Um, I switched up to 13, 21, and 34. And the, uh, the value of the Fibonacci numbers is that the, it's based on um, the golden mean or the mathematical constant phi, uh, which is an irrational number. By using an irrational number as the ratio between uh, the periods, you don't wind up with any of the periods being uh, even multiples of any of the others. Mm. If you get if you get averages that move in and out of sync, it can cause odd problems in your indicators. Um, so by picking a number, you know you could use any of a number of other numbers. You could use the constant e or or whatever. Um, but uh, the Fibonacci numbers are are easy, and like I say, it's it's an irrational ratio, so uh, you don't run into that synchronization problem. Mm, yeah. All right. Well, let's have a look at the um, the application of these um, these moving averages because obviously there's a couple of ways you could read them. So, do you want to um, explain uh, the ways that you use these three moving averages? Yeah. Uh, what I did was after I got the averages and they looked like they were doing pretty well uh, as far as tracking uh, the trends without giving too many bad signals, um, I decided to run a test. And uh, in the test, uh, what I did was was just pulled some some methods out of a hat to see which one of these ways of, of testing the turns uh, would give us the best results. And so one of the tests was, I used the same test as, as Bill Williams did on his alligator, and that was that the three averages had to be lined up in order uh, with, with fastest on top, middle one in the middle, and the slowest one on the bottom. Uh, and that was how you detected uh, an uptrend. And so I used that as one test. And then I used um, another test where I measured the slopes of each of the three averages. And when the slopes of all three were up, then uh, that was a long signal. When, when all three were down, it was, was a signal to get out. And a uh, third one was a thing called the simple test. And that was um, just just the third way of, of deciding what constituted an up signal and, and, and a get out signal. Um, so uh, if we go to that uh, chart with the uh, the three tables on it, yeah, this one, yeah, there we go. Okay, that was the result. What I did was I tested all three of those methods on the SPX index over uh, basically starting in 1998 and going to, I think it was 2018 at that time. Yeah, it was. Um, and so I looked at the performance and on each of those, hold on a second, I got to get my own copy because <laughs> I don't remember what the numbers are. Um, but okay, the one in the upper left hand corner is the strict test, and that's where uh, all three averages are lined up. And in that one, the average holding period was uh, 262 days, and um, it, it did a a reasonably good job at, at making money. Um, the total return over 21 years, okay, it must have been 2019 when I did this test, because I know I started in 98, and that gave uh, 261% return over the 19 years, which was pretty good. Um, and the uh, the test where we looked at uh, the simple test 
that was that gave like 1500% return. However, the average holding period was 35 days. So that was a little too fast moving. Um, you know, it, it looks really impressive, but, but you, you had really have to watch it every day. Uh, and that just wasn't practical for, for most people. So uh, the three slope test, which is in the bottom row, um, that had an average period of 207 days in the market, and it gave a return of 354% over the, the 19 years. Um, and I settled on that one because one, the holding period was, was appropriate for people doing retirement stuff. Um, and that seemed like the, the, the best balance. So that's the one that uh, I use on my charts on the uh, website. Mm, yeah. So um, just looking at that, um, that example, bottom left, the one you chose, the sample size is yeah. about, it's about 20 trades. If I read that right, it's a bit, little bit smaller on my screen. So maybe I'm uh, misinterpreting it, but um, th that's quite a low sample size. How do you, uh, put trust in something like that? Um, well, this was just the summary. I right. also ran charts for every year, and on the charts, it showed all three tests side by side, and I spent quite a number of days walking through those and seeing how the how the indicator reacted to, um, you know, real market scenarios. Um, you know, how did it respond to the crash of, of 2000 to 2003? How did it respond to the, the crash in 2007? Um, you know, how fast did it get back in? Um, mm. You know, all of these things, uh, because, one of the things about any kind of indicator, uh, if you can't follow it, then it doesn't do you a whole lot of good. <laughs> um, so it had to have a balance between, between return and um, basically the confidence level so that as, as, as users looked at it, they could go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Mm. Because then they would follow it. They wouldn't second guess it. So that was a critical issue. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, you've prepared a couple of examples for us, haven't you, on the slides? we we'll take a quick look at those. Yeah. Yeah. So let me just put yeah, them up on the screen. The for, uh... Okay. It's a little bit small on the screen. Yeah. So apologies for that. Okay, so that has to be the one from 1998 to 1999. And um, there are two lines on there. One of them is the SPX itself. And one of them is the, uh, the equity curve. Uh, the black line is the SPX. The equity curve is the green line. And on all three of those, on the left half of the chart, the green line is hidden behind the SPX because um, it started off in the market because we just came off that 10 year bull, bull market. Um, and then we have a row of dots across the bottom and the dots, uh, when they change from green to red, that means time to get out. And when they change from red to green, it's time to get back in. And you notice that as we hit just about the middle of the chart, and just a little to the right of that. All three of the systems, because we got the we got the, the strict test at the top. Um, oh, excuse me, it's a simple test. Then the three slope and the third test at the bottom, um, and you can see slight differences between 
when they got out and when they got back in. Yeah. And uh, the one at the top, that one got out a little bit later than the others, and it took it longer to get back in, and that's why its equity curve uh, is lower than the SPX. The one in the middle pretty much tracks the SPX. There's a section of about two months where you were out, and then it got right back in as the, the SPX crossed it. And the one at the bottom got out sooner uh, and got back in about the same as the one in the middle. And so that way, um, it actually was was ahead of the SPX as far as the equity curve. Um, mm. So this was this was where I was going through and looking at these charts and saying, okay, are people when when this thing gives a signal, are people going to believe it, or are they going to go, well, no, I think we're okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, and if we go to the next page. That's 99 to 2000. And you can see the top chart, uh, the equity curve is still below the, uh, the SPX. Uh, the one in the middle is kind of fiddling around it. Um, and the bottom one, which is, which is the really fast one, that's above it. Um, now, by the time we got to 2003 and hit the bottom of the, uh, the bear market, at that point, all of them started beating the SPX as far as, as the equity in the account um, and, and considered to, do, to beat it more and more. Um, so um, the signals looked believable. Uh, they, were, they were seldom enough that um, it was a workable system. And it, it was credible. And this, uh, this paper is published on the website. Uh, it's in the articles section. And it's called The Three Faces of the MTA. So that uh, anybody who goes to the website can go through this, this and actually look at all the charts for 19 years uh, and see how this thing behaves. And I put that up there just so that uh, people who came to the website and wanted uh, some advice about what the heck do we do now, uh, they could look at that and and satisfy themselves that, yeah, this system really does work. Okay? It's not just something cooked up. And mm. the other big feature of this is it's not a black box. In, in the paper, I explain everything about the system so that, so that people can do it themselves if they want to. They don't have to use mine, um, and I I really dislike black box systems. <laughs> uh, they drive me nuts because yeah. I need to know why. What's it doing? How does it do that? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I, I guess as well the um, you know this what you're sharing with us here is really quite a simple solution, right? It's a very simple indicator, and the way you're applying it is is not complex at all. Do you think it's important to have simple solutions in trading? Yes. Uh, complex solutions tend to be brittle. Um, and in, in the software world, if a system is brittle, that means uh, it doesn't take much to leave it in pieces on the floor. <laughs> and uh, so... Uh, Ford Aerospace did, did a big study back in the 80s. Uh, they spent three years and millions and millions of dollars doing a test to see uh, what made software reliable. And uh, they, uh, they wrote up this big report. And, and the whole result of this thing, which which... You know, if you spend millions of dollars, you better have a big fat report at the end of it. Uh, and so they they found numerous ways to explain why 
the real answer here is that, that R equals one over P um, and R is reliability and P is the number of paths through the software. If you have, if you have a function where there's only one path, it goes in the top, it comes out the bottom. Um, that function is completely reliable. It will always do what you expect it to do. Uh, if it has two paths through it, well, reliability one over P, two paths. So, so now the reliability is actually 50%. <laughs> and if it has a dozen paths through it, your reliability is <clears throat> tiny. <laughs> so, um, and the reason they spent all this money and did, did all this work uh, is because they were writing software for the aerospace program. And uh, they, they had seen, th there were some spectacular failures in aerospace exploration. Um, there was, there was a, uh, a rocket that was supposed to go to the moon and do a soft landing on the surface. Uh, this wasn't one of Ford's things. This was just NASA. And uh, it was, what it was supposed to do was it was supposed to approach the surface of the moon. And when it got to about 35,000 feet of altitude, it was supposed to fire retro rockets and slow the, slow the spacecraft down. So it did a, a soft landing on the moon. And uh, there was a bug in the program so that after, after, you know, millions of dollars in, in sending this thing all the way up there, um, it's approaching the moon and it gets down to about 25,000 feet. And one of the engineers in the control center looks at the panel and goes, the retro rockets aren't firing. And he flips a switch to fire them manually. And, um, unfortunately, if they're supposed to fire at 35,000, and by the time the signal got there, it was about 15,000. <laughs> um, the, uh, the landing on the moon was at about 800 miles per hour, <laughs> which tends to be really hard on your equipment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet. So, so that's why Ford did that study, uh, because... Uh, it, it turned out that there was a one character error in the, in the program. Oh. And that cost, you know, in addition to the equipment and the fuel and the launch and, and the whole thing, okay, it also took several dozen engineers three months to find that one character error. Oh, goodness. So they finally knew, oh, well, that's what happened. <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah. uh, so simple, simple is good. Um, and uh, simple is reliable. Mm, yeah. In the chat, we've got a, a comment from Ilya, rapid, unexpected disassembly. And I think that's, <laughs> that's exactly, <laughs> that's a nice way to put it. Thanks, Ilya. <laughs> <laughs> so so then I guess so what's the the direct correlation between that and trading is that the complexity is the the type of indicator the number of indicators what is you know what's the direct relation to that to uh, into trading that is Ah okay um lots of people want to understand the market um unfortunately you can't the reason you can't is that the market is what's called a complex adaptive system. Uh, complex adaptive systems are the result of the confluence of thousands or millions of inputs. And after, after each input, then there is a adaptation to what what the result was. Uh, so the market is constantly changing. Um, and even if you had all the data, 
um, you still really couldn't predict anything. Uh, people people are always looking for for ways to predict what the market's going to do. Well, you can't. Uh, it's just not possible. Um, and so the uh, the whole thing. Uh, you have to accept the notion that you can't predict it. You have to follow it. Um, all the information that you have right now is all the information you're going to get uh, until tomorrow. Hmm. So, um, you know, you can have perfect answers if you don't mind getting them far too late to act on. But, um, you know, prediction is just not in the cards. It's, it's not there. So. Yeah. Yeah. Now I know we're, we're planning to talk about trend lines next, but I want to just uh, slot in a little question. I've got a, a note at the end here or a point at the end of my notes here of a statement you made, which I think I was going to save it for if we, if we had um, some spare time, but I think we really need to slot it in now because it kind of, I think it's going to link to what you were just saying then. And the statement is technical indicators don't work, um, which I think is probably going to get some people's heads fuming, ready to explode. <laughs> Can you explain what do you mean by that? Why, why do you say technical indicators don't work? Okay. Well, actually, I didn't say that. Oh. Um, but, but a couple of guys who did a very big study on the markets did. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a book which I think it was published in the 1990s called The Encyclopedia of Technical Indicators by Colby and Myers. And Colby and Myers went through all of the moving averages that were available all of the things like the RSI and the ADX and the um, stochastics and, and all of these other things. And at the end of the book, there's one paragraph that basically says, none of these things work. You can't, you can't just code it up, turn it loose and have it make money. And the, con the conclusion is that it's the interactive or it's the interaction of the analyst and the indicator. It's what, it's what the indicator says to their brain. That's what allows them to interpret what they should do next. Um, so this is why some people love stochastics. Uh, personally, I look at a stochastic and it does not do anything for me at all. Um, uh, some people like the ADX. Uh, some people like the RSI. Um, because it, it's, it speaks to them. Mm. So the indicator by itself you can't, you can't just, like I say, code it up and, and have it run off and make money. Uh, and even if you could, it'd break pretty rapidly because somebody else would notice and they'd start doing it. And somebody else would notice and they'd start doing it. And pretty soon, everybody is using the same indicator. And at that point, it loses all predictive value. So. Um, it's, it's the combination of the person who's looking at it and the indicator itself that gives you uh, a result where you can do something with it. Hmm. Okay. So a lot of people get very disappointed when they hear that. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to predict the future. Sorry. Yeah. So that's yeah it was it was colby and myers that basically what they said at the end was the only thing they found that actually made money was a 10-day simple moving average <laughs> they said if if you do that you know 
you can you can actually code that and and it will make you money. It doesn't make you much. It doesn't, you know, you're not going to get rich off of it. But, um, you know, if you can put enough money behind it, um, you can uh, you can make money fast enough to, to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you did you say that that study was in the 90s, 1990s something? I think, um, you know. I people- think so. Um, it was it was a book. Um, I'm pretty sure the name is the uh, Encyclopedia of Technical Indicators. Mm. Uh, it's by Colby and Myers. Could have been in the '80s, um, but uh, I think you can still get it. I think it's still available. Right. And, okay. Uh, they they did just a huge amount of research. Uh, because they coded every one of those indicators and, and test ran them uh, and wrote up the whole thing. Uh, so they they did some yeoman work putting that together. Mm, yeah, I bet. But I guess you, you probably could argue that the markets have changed a lot since then and you know, computing power and analysis techniques and you know machine learning is... Um, I mean, it was available back then, but, you know, it's exploded recently and lots of AI techniques and things. Do you think that all um, goes in the same group as well or uh, or not? Do you think that, that that's changed now with, with the changes in the market and computing power? There was a company, and I don't know if they still exist. This was down in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, It was called the Prediction Company. Uh, It was run by a bunch of physicists. Um, And I'm trying to remember the name of the guy who started the whole thing. Uh, I'm I'm sure you can find this on the net. Um, Mm. And they had a bunch bunch of scientists got together and created this system that um, actually made money all by itself. Um, But uh, can't can't remember the guy's name. Uh, That's okay. It'll come to me as soon as we get off the air. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) So there, there are people who do that. um, And, uh, the big trading houses. Um, I saw a study on, I think it was JP Morgan, where over over a 1,200 day period they had one losing day, um, and they're they're all doing quant stuff. So it can be done. Uh, it cannot be done through prediction. Uh, it's it has to do with uh, very very fine grained following the market mm, yep oh uh, we've got a comment in the chat here i think jones has found it the prediction company doin farmer norman packard and james mcgill is, is that farmer. it yeah farmer <laughs> yeah that was the guy good job thanks jones okay well we should move on i know um we've got some trend line stuff that you want to share and uh we're going to run out of time soon so um we'll just push on a little bit here um, so uh, you're from Trendline Dynamics. You're obviously a Trendline specialist. Do um, can we talk about Trendlines for a little bit? Can you share some basics before sure. we dig in a little bit deeper? So yeah, um, I think you've got some slides, right? Let me just put them up here. Yeah, let me go flip a light on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, there are basically three kinds of support and resistance. Mm-hmm. Um, one of them is psychological, one of them is historical, and the third one is trend lines. Uh, this is an example of psychological support and resistance. Uh, psychological support and resistance happens at large round numbers. Uh, in this case, the top number is 75, the bottom number is 60, and um, 
those things just pinging back and forth between those two levels. Um, mm. So, you know, the psychological levels, you know, 100, 150, 200, anything that's a multiple uh, basically of, of 10 or 25, um, that's where the psychological levels show up. If we go to the next one, that's historic um, support and resistance. And historic support and resistance is based on previous activity. Okay, The lower zone on there is like between 20 point mumble in about 195 mm. and the upper one is is around 21 and a half I think um, and interestingly enough um, you have you have resistance up at that level until price gets above it and then in December that that Price comes down, hits that same level, and what was resistance is now support. Um, and this is a, a well-known principle. So that's the historic, which is based on price action. And the third one is trend lines. Now, trend lines, um, you see a lot of people uh, doing a lot of colorful things with them. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about here on this slide is that knowing when to get in, a uh, trend line can be useful for that. Uh, we have the XYZ trend line there, and it goes through the tops uh, of the two highs in November. And at the point where uh, price crosses above, that XYZ line, there's your entry point. Mm. So let's go on to the next one. Yeah, so there you go. Okay, so here we have, uh, this is the Q's, and this is um, about a 14-month chart. Um, when you're going to go to draw a trend line, you always start with the one that's on <laughs> the losing side, so to speak. Uh, okay, this is obviously going up from from March, um, and because it's rising, you do the lower trend line first, and uh, you just you just fiddle around until you find places where where it, it touches the the major low points, and once you have the lower one, then you go to look for for the upper one, and you want it to be kind of parallel if possible. It doesn't always work out that way, um, but so you do the you do the, the one on the bottom. On a rising trend, then you do the one on top. Uh, and once you've got those and you're pretty happy with those, then something you can do is, is throw in the center line. Uh, and the center line tells you stuff uh, sometimes, usually. Well, yeah, usually. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, if sometimes you, you the message you get is not what you wanted, but <laughs> that's why I was <laughs> hesitating there. Um, uh, if you want some good directions on drawing trend lines, uh, if you go to um, Victor Sparandio's book, uh, Trader Vic 2, which was uh, professional speculation, I think. Um, and look at the way he explains it on pages 144 and 145. Uh, that's, I think, the best explanation of how to draw good trend lines. And that was one of the things that uh, I used 
as as I was working forward in my program to to get it to to automatically draw trend lines for me. Mm. Um, so anyway, uh, let's go ahead. Yeah, we've actually uh, we've had a question in the chat about programmatically doing that, um, but we'll we'll go through the next couple of slides and we'll come back to that because I'm sure a lot of people want to yeah. hear your yeah, experience will, doing that. We will so, talk about that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, this is your basic ABC setup. Okay, an ABC you got you got a local low, uh, then price comes up, makes makes a high after that comes down and makes another low, but it's not as low as the one at first, and that's the C point. And the thing about um, the ABC setup is how do you get in? Um, the standard answer is when price gets above the high at B, then you can do your entry. But using a trend line on the next slide, By drawing in that trend line between the previous high and the B high, as soon as price crosses that, there is your entry point. Now, in this particular case, price crosses the B high and it crosses the trend line on the same day. So it didn't mm -hmm. get you any advantage. But this is a very short ABC setup because uh, I wanted something that was easy to read. Uh, on, when you get out to, to longer ABC setups, then your trend lines can get you a fairly significant advantage. So that's what this slide was all about. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, it's now a good time to ask about how to do that systematically. Or pro I'm just trying to find the comment from Ilya. Here we go. I'm going to put it up on the screen. Uh, here we go. Is there a way to programmatically determine these trend lines? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any more than yes? <laughs> well, okay. Now the other part of the answer is, um, you know, I've had, I've had people ask me, well, you know, uh, how would you do it? And, and my answer is, don't even bother. Um, I, I started fiddling around with trying to get the computer to draw trend lines in 2001 mm. and tried one thing after another. Um, I started with uh, using uh, a regression line and putting putting lines on either side of the regression line. Um, that didn't work. And then tried other things and other things. Um, and ultimately it took me basically 12 years of full-time programming, 40 hours a week to get a program that would draw trend lines that were good um, and in fully automatic, I didn't have to do anything, uh, but it is incredibly difficult. If if I had known in 2001 how much work it was going to be, I never would have done it. I would have just been drawing the trend lines myself. <laughs> mm. So um, yeah, it's it's possible, uh, and and yeah, it'll make you crazy. Uh, so. It is not simple by any means. Mm, okay. Uh, it, it kind of a related question here from Ola. Um, you put it up on the screen. How would you use support resistance and trend line systematically? Ah. I guess the first challenge is trying to identify them systematically. Or programmatically. Yeah, um, I have I have my program that that 
does the trend lines for me. Uh, and I knew that the program was, was starting to work pretty well when it was finding trend lines that I didn't notice myself. I'm looking at the charts and spitting. I'm going, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, but in order to bring trend lines and support and resistance together, uh, I do that all manually um, because if, if you go to my website and you look at the charts uh, for, for any um, of the uh, uh, securities I follow, what you'll see is on, on the chart page up at the top are the trend lines. And those trend lines, um, sometimes there are none. Sometimes the software just can't find anything because, because there's so much noise in that particular security. Uh, but uh, it'll find as, as many as three uh, different trend line lengths uh, and it charts those. And then underneath that is the MTA, which gives me an idea of where are we in the cycle Where's, where's that going? Uh, and then below that, then I have six other charts. Um, and I take all those into account. And uh, support and resistance automatically, uh, this, this sounds kind of funny, but but my brain automatically does that just because I've been looking at charts for so long. <laughs> mm. um, it's, it's just a matter of practice. Uh, yeah. And it's impossible to make any generalizations about it because uh, it's, it's always case by case basis. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, I'm conscious that our time is just about up, but I wanted to uh, ask you, uh, one more thing, and that's about the importance of persistence. Because I know that um, some of your research, you've been you've been working twenty five years to get an indicator to work, and I think that's probably a lot more than most people would bother with. Some might go twenty five hours or twenty five days. Um, it's obviously incredibly important yeah. to you. Do you. Can you give us a little bit of a um, insight into your your ideas on persistence? Well, back in 1995, I had this idea for a trailing stop. And I wanted to make a trailing stop that would, would stick close to price and, and not crash into it. Uh, I didn't like the PSAR because, because the PSAR has a periodic element to it. Mm. And it, uh, if, if price goes flat, it just crashes into the price. And uh, so I wanted something different, but, but something that tracked price really closely. And uh, so I fiddled around for quite a number of months and couldn't get it to work. So I set it aside. A couple of years later, I went back and fiddled with it some more, a couple more months. And I've been doing that ever since. Uh, and spring of last year, I finally got it to work. <laughs> Congratulations. So, <laughs> so it's, it's the, the chart uh, in the lower set of charts called the ATS, uh, the Aaron's trailing stop. And um, that silly indicator took two and a half decades uh, to bring that thing to life and make yeah. it actually function. Um, so Is that it on the screen there? Is that the one you, you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you you got to just stick to it. You got to keep beating on it. Mm. In uh, in in trading, the only way you really lose is if you give up. That's an excellent philosophy to have. I think. Yeah. All right then. Well, uh, thank you very much, Doc. We're just about bang on time. We've got one minute left. So um, thanks for sharing all that. And we appreciate you going to all the effort of putting those charts together as well, because, um, you know, sometimes talking about these concepts without any visual 
is uh, pretty challenging, but it was nice that you prepared some uh, charts for us and you kept them simple as well. So thank you very much for putting in um, the uh, the effort for that. Now, um, th actually, there's a question that's just popped up. I was going to wrap up, but this is quite interesting. So I don't know if we can finish up on this question, uh, Doc, but let me put this up. It's in regards to the ATS. Uh, I don't know how much you want to share yeah. about that. Let me put it up on the screen. This is from Chuck. G'day, Chuck. Thanks for the question. What's the principle or design idea of the ATS? Uh. <laughs> I'm not ready to talk about that yet. Okay. Uh, it, it took too long to figure it out, and uh, maybe maybe in a couple of years. Okay. Well, we just put a we just put an image of it up on the screen, so Chuck, you can have a look at it visually and try and reverse engineer it. But I suspect uh, that could be a bit challenging. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it it shows what can be done. And uh, and all those charts are available on my website. Uh, the website's free. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to um, um, let people know how they can get in touch with you or learn more from you? Yeah. Um, uh, you can send me an email at uh, risk.analyzer at gmail.com. Uh, if you send me an email, uh, and you want, I will sign you up. I, I do a, a weekly um, analysis of the market, um, and you can sign up for that. There's no charge for that either. Uh, and also, uh, anybody who sends me an email, uh, I will send them the notes from this presentation, uh, which has some stuff that we... It's got more detail and, and a couple mm. of things we didn't get to talk about. Yep. Okay, excellent. Well, um, thanks for your time today, Doc. Really appreciate uh, coming to talk to us about identifying trends and sharing some of your uh, research with us and all the chart examples as well. It's really very much appreciated. And thank you for everyone uh, to everyone for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate you coming in and giving us some great questions and some great comments in the chat. And uh, I suspect some of you should probably go back to your partners now and celebrate Valentine's Day or something like that. Um, and uh, if you enjoyed today's show, please um, leave a comment in the, um, in the comments below and hit the thumb as well, the thumbs up just to show your support and, um, and share it with your friends as well. And uh, we'll be back here next week. Um, I don't actually have the topic or guest on my sheet for next week. I forgot that, so apologies. And I don't remember off the top of my head, but we will be uh, running next week. So head on over to bettersystemtrader.com for more details. And uh, thank you, everyone, again. And uh, have a good week. Thanks, Doc. Cheers. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. All right, cheers. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.